Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday q and I'm Eric Griffin, president of ITM Trading. With me, I have Lynette Zhang, our chief market analyst. For those of you who don't know or are tuning in for the first time, we take your questions that you submit to us via email to questions at itmtrading.com. We take them, put them on the screen here in front of us, so you get a real, true, live, organic response. Yep. Ready? Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New I'm Year. ready. I'm ready. This I heard that you're allowed to say year. that for one week. After. Okay. And okay. then after that, you can't anymore. It's one week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who made the rule. Juan J asks, how should we protect ourselves from a deflationary depression scenario? How will such economic conditions affect the price of gold in general and the price of collectible gold in your opinion? Well, not just my opinion, but based upon history, gold performs quite well in both inflationary as well as deflationary scenarios. But so definitely gold, um, silver performs okay during deflationary scenarios, but it's really gold that, that does the outperformance. Additionally, if you want to protect yourself from a depression, a deflationary depression, which you should, then you need the whole mantra, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. We're, I think we're, whatever you get done is great, but I think that we're too close to that to start from scratch, right? I mean, I've been collecting the gold and silver, that foundation, um, in earnest since 2002, and then setting up with the rest of the mantra since 2010. And <clears throat> I'm more ready than probably anybody else I know, but am I as ready as I'd like to be? No, that's a constant thing that I'm evolving. So therefore, community becomes critical. So I'd say gold, silver, community, so that you bring your skill sets and what you have to the table and you get into a community where other people bring their skill sets and what they have to the table. And so now collectively in community, you're ready to deal with the deflationary depression because that's, that's where I think, no doubt, that's where we're going. And, and it makes it kind of easy because there's well, only- Well, deflationary depression or hyperinflationary depression? Well, I think it's a hyperinflationary depression, really. But, but <coughs> that's where I was just going because there's only one way to fight inflation and that's with deflation and only one way to fight deflation and that's with inflation. So as things implode, now we go into that hyperinflationary cycle. But according to the money velocity chart, that is rising in a pervasive way. So I'm willing to put my technical neck on the line and say that I believe that that cycle has already begun. Even as you're having the IMF say, good job, Fed, you engineered a soft landing. Yeah, I don't think so. This ain't over yet. This is, this is, this is even barely getting started. So yeah, you, you wanna make sure that you can be as independent and self-sufficient as possible. Gold and silver definitely do that. They both perform quite well. Um, in fact, we could probably put up one of the charts that I have on how gold and silver perform during deflation. Where would you want to put it on so, the blog? Yeah, we could put it on the <coughs> blog. We could put, and, and Edgar, would you just make a note of that? You know which one I'm talking about, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll put that on there. So Juan, you can see that for yourself. All right, so Lorena B asks, I know that, I know that all are insolvent, that gold is, hmm, that gold maybe, is the way to go. Let's say maybe they're all need, in agreement that gold is the way to go. But still need to have the money in the bank for mm -hmm. everyday expense. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's, I know that all banks are insolvent. Maybe there's a word missing there. All banks are insolvent and that gold is the way to go. Okay. But we still need to have money in the bank for everyday expenses. Mm -hmm. What should we look for when picking up a bank to deposit our money? <clears throat> Well, for one thing, you should only have in the bank, bank, well, you should do whatever you're comfortable with. For me personally, I have enough cash in the bank to meet my expenses, and if it goes to zero and they bail in, it's not going to impact me because I also have cash outside of the bank so that I can always make a deposit, even if they charge me. I still, that, that wouldn't get bailed in. Um, I think you're probably okay up to the insured level, 
The reason why you hear my hesitancy is the FDIC diff fund, so the fund that they have for bailing out uh, customers is lower than it was last March and April when we had the bank failures begin. So it's really not there, but could the government print money or the central bank print money to put in there? Well, they didn't have enough to bail out the banks that failed, so they went around the system and got the money to deposit to bail, even though they don't want you to call it a bailout, but to bail out those that have been chosen, right? Um, you know, I mean, I, I like smaller banks and community banks and that kind of thing. I, I like them better because they don't do all the stuff that the big JP Morgans do. But JP Morgan is too big to fail. Right. Well, there's no reason, we've said that before, like the two big to fail banks probably are the safest because they're the ones who generally last through like the last bank And absorb, crisis, right? And absorb the assets of the smaller banks. Right, so, I mean, you could do both. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have money in two banks, right? And have, be do like your major banking with, with um, you know, small community banks, like the day-to-day -day transaction type right. stuff, and then have money with JP Morgan that's separate. Yeah, but there, there's no I reason. I think you and Plus, I will agree that, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase is probably, you know, a too big to fail bank. I will, yeah, we, we do agree with probably that. Probably the. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're the largest, most systemically important bank. Um, additionally, you know, you really do only want to have enough in there that it's really not going to impact you if you lose it. So taking cash out of the system, you can always make that deposit in makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, it's all part of the strategy. If, yeah. if you haven't done this yet, click that Calendly link below and set up a time to speak with one of our stress, uh, our uh, specialists and have your goals in mind. And then they're going to ask you questions on what your current circumstance is. So they can help you um, see, and then of course it's all up to you, but they can help you see how much cash you should keep in the bank, how much you should take out of the bank, the protective gold and silver, you know, depending, it depends on your gold. Because as, as you guys know, there's different kinds of gold for different functions and silver too for different functions. So, um, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't keep more in there than if it went away tomorrow, it would not have a negative impact on me. It would be annoying, but it wouldn't be negative. Yeah. Just thinking about how, because interest rates are higher now, you know, that so many people are, they want to have the money in the bank because you can earn that, you know, five, five and a half percent just on a regular CD, right? Right. So a lot of people well, are in that. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, look, they're always going to entice you either to come in or to stay in once you're in because it's so much easier to rob you when you have everything inside of the system. And when you're looking at The Great Taking, right, that book, I mean, really, this is, this is all collateral because as J.P. Morgan, he said it the best, only gold is money, everything else is credit. And therefore, everything is debt-based these days and it's contract-based and it's all counterparty risk because any contract is only as good as the counterparty to that contract. And it's all vulnerable. That's the collateral on which all this leverage is built. It's all vulnerable. All right, so Zeglin asks, I have seen Western world governments borrowing money for years. My question is, whom <laughs> are they borrowing the money from? A number of entities. They are borrowing it from their own central banks, which up until 2008, even though ours, ours was, uh, but that was like a taboo kind of thing. That was just something that third world countries did because they couldn't generate uh, enough buyers of their debt outside of their borders. You said because ours was, but we missed, you, you must have been thinking about it but didn't say it. What did you mean by that? Oh, the Federal Reserve started buying our government debt at the end of 2002. So right. before but that, they, they weren't bar. We were not borrowing from the central bank. Correct. We were just selling treasuries into the market, and that's how we would get. Right. Right. And so to answer this question, I mean, it's kind of like I'll wash your back, you wash my back. So other governments, other central banks are buying 
the bonds. And sometimes, you know, it's been questionable about where that money is getting funneled from to buy the bonds. That I don't know, and I'm not going to know. Uh, but there's been a transition, and, and there were also the market makers, so Wall Street, right? But you, everybody really needs to understand that if it's a government or a central bank or even market makers on Wall Street that are buying the bonds, those are stronger hands and deeper pockets. And so over, they don't really care about the fluctuations too much in the value of the bonds and things like that. But those entities have been leaving this market. I did a video on that not that long ago. Uh, but, but those entities are leaving this market and what's filling in this market are traders. And we could see that shift into 2013, right? Remember the, that VIX on the 10-year treasury and retirement funds. So, so mutual funds and some hedge funds and some ETFs and all of that. So it's the public that have become... I don't know if they're the biggest buyer of the government bonds, but definitely the onus to absorb all of this debt has been <coughs> transferred to shorter term players and with not as deep pockets. Because if it's a mutual fund or it's an ETF and they get a lot of redemptions, guess what? They're going to have to sell the bonds. So this is one of the reasons why we're seeing so much more volatility in this space and the lack of liquidity, which really we've been talking about since 2015, because that's the first time it really reared its ugly head. But hey, what do you expect when you transition it from more stable hands into trading hands? I mean, come on, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, anybody could see that if they mm -hmm. understood what was happening and you look at that TYVIX chart, and maybe Edgar, you can put that up on the blog as well. And maybe the link to the video. That's the old one that where they stopped doing that. Correct. Well, stop tracking it. Correct. They, they, they don't want you to see it. Yeah. Um, and maybe yeah, the fine. video that I did on that, uh, the recent video that I did on that, so you, you can see that. But yeah, yeah, the traditional players are getting out, and the, the longer term players are getting out, and the shorter term public is getting in. So I heard, I heard you say the great taking and I saw there was a thing on the screen here. Did you read that book? I did. Um, and actually I just did a piece on it yesterday. So if you haven't seen that yet, uh, that was published at six o'clock. Huh? Yeah. It, well, it's it was everything that, that, we, everything I was that just you just exactly. say. But, but it just makes you even more terrified, doesn't it? I mean, not you cause you're fully protected. But, right. but you know what I mean? Like you're watching it. I watched the video over the Christmas break and I, and I was just like, this is everything we've been saying, but it's just solidified by somebody else saying it. And it's just, oh gosh, this is so terrible. This is so terrible. That's all I kept doing. Like I told some people, I go, you need to watch this, but uh, just so you know, when you get done, you're going to feel terrible. You know, I mean, look. When you're prepared, the, the mm -hmm. thing is, is people will see it coming. And a lot of people that are watching, they know that this is what's happening. And it's not something that's happening in the future. It's something that's right. been transitioning right. for a long time. And I can't even tell you how grateful I am that I'm 69 years old and that I became a stockbroker in the 80s. Because, and I was, you know, was there on Black Monday, but, but beyond that, I started studying currencies in 87. I wouldn't know any of this had that not happened. And, you know, any, anybody that's my age, you know, can look back and they can go, oh, wow, well, I was there. I remember what that was like. I remember what happened with Nixon taking us off the gold standard, which doesn't sound so bad, but... You know, we didn't get the whole story. Don't worry, there's not going to be any inflation. Just buy American. Well, of course, then globalization was a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. So they shipped all the jobs overseas where the corporations could buy bodies and labor a whole lot cheaper, right? And they made the agreement with China to tie their currency to our currency. So now, I, I, I mean, you just watch all of this and you go... Export the inflation overseas, keep things cheap. But, and keep the wages lower. Keep the wages lower, yep. <laughs> right? And then, and you know, I mean, we we felt the 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 impact of that loss of the whole supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. And that that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about being prepared. 
right? What what not I've been needing able to do chain. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's critical. So anybody that's sitting there procrastinating and thinking, oh, we only have as much time as we have. And if you just think back to 2008, I'm watching closely. Shearson's my alma mater. Not thinking that could possibly happen. Right. Right? Totally. Watch um, when you're just hanging out and not doing a bunch of research. Uh, on Netflix, do you have Netflix? I do, but I don't know how to access it. <laughs> she, you maybe should cancel that subscription then. <laughs> Megan uh, put it on there. But uh, you should watch Leave the World Behind. Oh, okay. It's just a, it's like a two hour movie. My daughter and I watched it, and but it's, it's really, it'll make you feel good about like your level of preps. Yeah, you'll right. like you'll like that from that perspective. Right. Uh -huh. But I'm not going to give you any of it. I'm not going to tell you anything that happens so that you can watch it. And, and it's worth it's definitely worth the watch. Okay, it's fun, it's interesting, and you just go wow. Maybe you could text me that later, yeah. and I'll yeah, yeah. I'll I'll <clears throat> call Megan. She'll tell me how Put to it. access. Here's how you it. do it. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chris T. I've heard you make comments about the spot market mm -hmm. price. I'm assuming gold and silver spot market prices. Yeah. And how they're manipulated. Mm -hmm. How do they do this? It's really simple. They just create more contracts that that um, oversee a certain level, 500 ounces, 100 ounces, because there's all different levels of contracts, and even for central banks. So they can create a whole bunch of gold and silver that does not nor ever will exist on the planet, but the markets read it as if there's a whole bunch more gold and silver out there. And so that's how they do it. It's really simple. Now, I can't really tell you the exact level now, but I know that um, before I knew how to do print screen, I was in with the Bank for International Settlements. So this would have been like 2009. And according to the Bank for International Settlements, at that time, there were 62,000 ounces of derivative or paper gold, digital gold, for every one physical ounce. Well, I don't know if the market's reading 50, 62,000 ounces for every one. Do you think that might move the price? Yeah, it definitely keeps it lower because there's a lot more supply than there is, right? Ex and there's actual physical. Exactly. So when you're looking at the spot market, you really need to understand that that is just a contract price. And the and, and this is true for all pricing anymore because all assets have been financialized. They've all been turned into financial assets that are easily traded. So that's what you have to look look understand. And there are certainly a lot of graphs, and I mean, I've used them, where they'll go in and you know that it's that it's probably a bullion bank or somebody attached to the government because they will do a huge dumperuski mm -hmm. of gold and silver in off hours, right? So if there's something major that's happening, especially, that's when you're gonna see it and you can see. Now, if you're really a trader, you're gonna wanna lock in best price. So if you have a tremendous amount of contracts to sell, you're not gonna do it at the same time because that's not gonna get you the best price. You're gonna feed it slowly into the market so you can capture best price. So, you know, th there's lots of evidence out there. There's even admissions from the <laughs> central bankers to doing that. Well, what if we just, Alan Greenspan, the great maestro, right? Well, what if we just tweaked what people see on gold? That changes not just the price, but the psychology because they don't want people to buy gold even while they're doing it hand over fist. So that that's, and I'll tell you what, Chris, do a search if you want to know just how simple this is. You guys know Kramer. You know I'm not a fan of Kramer. But uh, if you do a search on YouTube, he talks about how easy it is to manipulate the markets, which he did when he was a broker at a hedge fund or wherever he was. It's really an interesting interview. I don't know if it's still out there, but I saw it years ago. Huh. I think I probably even captured that link. I, I, I can check. So do a search on it, but I'll look 
um, after this to see if I have that link. I'll see if it's live. And if it is, then I'll give it to Edgar and he'll post it in the blog. Right. But it was, it was an inter <clears throat> interesting interview. Yeah, it's nothing to manipulate prices of anything. And if you think that anything like oil or water or anything else is about a supply and demand market, it's not. It's a trade. Everything has become a trading market. It's important for the banks to make their profits. Matthew C. asks, how will the overnight reset impact military pensions? <clears throat> well, they might um, give you an increase to offset, but only part of it. They might not give you that increase to offset, but the way that it impacts any pensions, military or otherwise, is you can buy a whole lot less like maybe 90% less. That's how it impacts. So I, I mean, I hate to, that's a, that's a short answer, but yeah, well, that's every, an all, accurate answer. Yeah, all, all fixed income products are gonna be messed up well, from that. Right, but I mean, the overnight reset, it, like it just happened in, I think, Argentina, December 13th, they did a 50% devaluation of their currency. And they actually even talked about the fact that it was going to make it a whole lot harder for pensioners because now their pesos, yes, peso, buys that much less. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is really why I talk about um, so much the importance of being fully prepared with food, water, energy, et cetera, that whole mantra piece. Because if you're dependent upon a pension or any kind of fixed income product or debt product or mutual fund or all of these fiat money things for your income, number one, I, I know the original design was for the markets to go up and absorb that inflation, right? But they, they aren't, especially as we go into hyperinflation. And the unions, rise of the unions, that part is fabulous. But you look at what they're negotiating, and when you know the truth, you realize that they're still behind the eight ball, even with however, whatever the level of raises that they're able to negotiate. So, you know, execute the mantra. Did you know your name's Annette? I've been called worse. <laughs> Mittmont asks, you used to talk about the LIBOR uh -huh. being replaced with SOFR. Uh -huh. Did the Fed somehow fix the rate so it really hasn't moved since it started in August? <clears throat> the answer is no, and the answer is also that we have not seen that impact yet. And that a lot of what, and I, this is my opinion, so I, I am not saying that this is absolutely a fact. But I do think that a lot of what has been happening with the raising of the rates, et cetera, is partly to hide the real problem in this transition. Just like the banking crisis, is that over yet? Maybe this transition had an impact on those banks that went out. So because it would have an impact on the derivatives. It would have an well, impact on all of the contracts. So if they, the rates have gone higher since all, because most of the contracts were probably put in when rates were much lower, because exactly. rates are pretty high now compared to like, what, 27 years or something? Um, can't be that. No, uh, they held them at zero for 15 years. So 15. So a lot of these contracts were written when LIBOR was a lot lower. Right. So you and might, they do you have could, a synthetic. It seems like it makes sense, make it hidden. Hidden, exactly. And not only that, but there is still, even though they're not publishing it because they're trying to do this transition, there is still a synthetic LIBOR that those legacy contracts that couldn't be converted are still associated with. Hmm. So we have not seen, and thank you for bringing that up, because we have not seen the end of this saga. We have not seen that at all. It's just hidden because the guys that create this garbage are also manning manning it and keeping it opaque. This is just a really opaque market, but it ain't over yet. That, that I would, can't give you a lot of guarantees, but I'll give you that one. It ain't over yet. Paul Stevenson asks, I keep hearing about the reverse repo market running out of money this spring. Can you explain why that's bad for the banks and what would we expect if that happens? 
You know, I actually have that on my um, slate to actually do something on for next week. So, Paul, can I ask you to just tune into that? Um, that will probably be a Thursday one because that's kind of deeper. But, um, yeah, I'll be talking about that. So I'm going to say stay tuned on that one until next week. Okay, cool. Well, that's, that's it for today. Okay, well, I think we're off to a pretty interesting start of the year. Um, this is also, isn't this an election year? Yeah. So it should be kind of interesting um, mm -hmm. to see what happens and how they can <clears throat> kind of keep control of underlying crises that might erupt. I think next year's, I think we're going to see a lot more volatility. But if you haven't, Go ahead and watch the video that I did yesterday on the great taking, which is about the greatest wealth transfer in history. We've been talking about it. It's a great book. Also, Daniela just had an interview with Loxman Achikthen, who is absolutely brilliant. And God, I've been following his work for probably about 22 years. That's yeah. happening later today. We used to interview him for, on recordings 25 years ago. Yep. Yep. Pretty cool. Co-founder of Economic Cycle Research Institute. They're the ones who do like forecasting of recessions for governments, Fortune 500s. It should be an interesting conversation. Yep. Very interesting. And also Taylor uh, just did one on, I think came out last Sunday. Does the Fed have authority to issue a CBDC without Congress approval? So you've got to watch that because there are, as we were talking, there are all sorts of ways to get around the system. But one thing we know for sure is whenever the central bank and the government want something, they discuss, probably spend more time discussing on how they're going to introduce it to the public so that the public does not tie that policy and that change back to them. So um, that is really an interesting video, something to pay a great deal of attention to. And, and again, if you haven't already started your gold and silver strategy, click that Calendly link below, get it done and get it executed. Because having the strategy is really important, but getting it executed is even more important. And, and there is something, even in the great taking, in every crisis, there's opportunities. And when you're looking at the strategy, it isn't just, I mean, it's critically important to sustain a reasonable standard of living. But if you can, you also want to be in a position to take advantage of what is happening. And I'm going to say it, come together in community because we vote with our wallets. Right. If you buy gold and silver, like I do, like Eric does, that's our vote. If you do other things, well, that's your vote. And we all get to vote to our conscious conscience. But I've been studying currency life cycle since 1987. Do you know anybody else that has? Me neither. So if you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe, leave us a comment, give us a thumbs up, help us spread the word by share, share, sharing, and please be safe out there. Bye-bye.